um, of June. Now I'm going to read the words, and we're going to Acts 12, 1 till 5. Um, and it says, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that this was met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleaved bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to the guarded, but handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. He wrote, intending to bring him out of, for public trial after the Passover. In het Nederlands, dus handelingen 12, um, 1 tot en met 5. Omstreeks die tijd nam koning Herodes enkele leden van de gemeente gevangen en mishandelde hen. Jacobus, de broer van Johannes, liet hij met de zwaard ter, ter dood brengen. Toen hij zag dat de Joden hier gunstig op reageerden, liet hij ook Petrus aanhouden. Dat was tijdens het feest van, van het ongedes, ongedesemde brood. Na de arrestatie sloot hij hem op in de gevangenis, waar hij hem door vier groepen soldaten van steeds vier man liet bewaken, met de bedoeling hem na het pas Pesachfeest ten overstaan van het volk te berechten. Terwijl Petrus onder, onder zware bewaking zat opgesloten, bleef de gemeente vol vuur vooraan bidden tot God. And I forgot the last verse in English. So... So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying um, to God for him. This is the word of God. I'm glad you remembered that verse, because that's the key one, that Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying, praying to God for him. Uh, we're keeping the service shorter today because uh, we have this uh, grand opening and the Dorpsdag, so uh, that's why there's been a little less music and my sermon today will be quite short compared to usual. But what I want to do is just review where we've been over the past six weeks because we had six weeks focused on prayer and the title for the series, House of Prayer, comes from the prophet Isaiah chapter 56 where it says that uh, well, God speaking says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So that's where we started with this uh, joyful recognition that God's house is open to all people. Because there in Isaiah 56, it says the foreigner who was previously excluded from coming into the temple, God's house, was now included. Uh, so he says, my house was not intended to be only for one group of people, but for all nations. And then we saw the next week when Pastor Jan preached that the, the idea of the temple is not just a building made of stones, but that we who are connected to Christ, who is the chief cornerstone, we are being built into a living temple. So the place where the temple is the place where God dwells, where God comes to, to meet with, uh, the way we go to meet with God. And we see what God wanted was not just a building, but a people. And that is the place where God dwells in his people, in the community. So we are a house of prayer, which means that we are also the priesthood. We are the ones who represent people to God in prayer and we represent God to people. And that is a deeply joyful thing for us to see, that we all have that privilege of speaking to God about people and speaking to people about God. Then we went for, uh, to the book of Acts. Uh, we saw that the people were always, they were constantly united in prayer because they loved each other, they liked to be together, and they loved God, so they were together talking to God, praying and waiting for God to pour out the Holy Spirit upon them, which is what happened on the day of Pentecost. So God's love was poured out into them when he poured out the Holy Spirit. Then we saw that they were uh, boldly speaking. They were bold in, in 
compassion, bold in the message about Jesus, bold in their willingness to suffer, all of that because they were bold in their prayers. People threatened, and they said, Lord, you consider their threats, and they did not ask God, save us from the danger, but God, make us bold. Make us able to speak even though people are threatening. And then uh, last week we saw, again, Pastor John preached about the, the powerful healing that took place in the name of Jesus. Not their power, it's not our power, but there is power in Christ. Now, today, last of them is that we see that the, the, the early church, the house of prayer, the people of God are desperately crying. That's a part of prayer. Sometimes there's a boldness, sometimes there's a, a power of healing, and sometimes there's a simply desperately asking God to answer, asking God to come through. Because they were in a desperate situation. Herod, uh, the governor or king of this area, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. That's not good. One of the leaders of the church, suddenly gone, killed. And Peter is next. It was a popular thing. Everybody was happy to see somebody killed, not the people, members of the church, but other people around. And so Peter is kept in prison. That's a desperate situation. You know what is going to happen next. Peter was kept in prison. That is a desperate situation. However, it, if, you, if you read uh, just a little beyond what Angelo read for us, you see that it wasn't desperate for Peter. He's the one in prison, and it's the night before his trial, which means the night before his execution, when he will be killed. And it says Peter was sleeping. Now, when most of us, we have a little bit of stress. There's a difficult situation at work. Or maybe you've, you're, you're staying up, you stayed up late for your exams, and then you have trouble falling asleep because you're worried about it or some conflict, or some something, right? Then you have trouble sleeping. Not Peter. The night before his death, and he's surrounded by four guards, and it says, Peter is fast asleep. Do you see this attitude in, in, in people sometimes? Uh, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, he says, uh, he also was in prison, waiting for his trial, and he says, which one do I prefer, to be set free and keep living, or to be put to death, because then I will depart and I will be with Christ? He says, for me, it's better to die, to depart, and to be with Christ, but for your sakes, I'd rather stay alive. So here's Paul saying, it doesn't really, I'm torn between the two. His attitude about life and death was different than most people. So Paul was also at peace. If I live, it's okay. If I die, it's okay. Even better. And it looks like it's the same for Peter, that, hey, it's, they weren't worried about James, the man who had been killed. They knew he was safe in the presence of God. And Peter knew the same for himself. If I'm killed, I am safe in the presence of God. It's the church who was crying out desperately for Peter, not Peter crying out desperately, God, you have to get me out of prison. You, God, you have to save me from death. Now, it is okay for us to pray that way when we are the ones in danger, but even more, it makes sense that the people who loved Peter, he's their friend, he's their apostle, they're the ones who feel that it's a desperate situation. They don't want him to die. He didn't mind. I actually do know people who, who that they've experienced that same thing. Uh, a family member gets sick, very sick, and they say, I'm at peace with it. I'm ready to be with the Lord. But the family members say, we're not ready for you to be with the Lord. We want you here. So then that is a desperate situation that motivates desperate prayer. Maybe you've heard the phrase, desperate times call for desperate measures. Desperate times call for desperate measures. In a football game, when one team is down and it's getting near the end of the game, there's not much chance left to even up the score. So what do they do? 
The coach says, everybody from the defense, including the goalkeeper, you're going to press forward. That's risky, right? Because you're leaving your goal open, your whole half of the field undefended. But it's a desperate time, so you take desperate measures. You're willing to take some risk. Or if you're very seriously sick, the doctor might say, well, we have one thing we can try, but it may not work, and it's risky. You have to weigh it, right? Is it worth it or not? Well, in this case, it's desperate for Peter, and Christian people do what they do by habit. They pray. It's not a risk. It's just a, there's a desperate situation, so what are they going to do? They're going to pray desperate prayers. God, we really need you to come through. Otherwise, this man, Peter, will be killed. We do not want that. And God, we don't think it's good for your church either to lose their leader. So this is the, for the Christians, it's their, the habit they have learned to pray all the time, but they are praying now in a more desperate way. If you read through, you see they're praying all through the night. Peter's in prison. It's the last night. It's the last night of his life. Peter's asleep in prison. They are awake praying. It said Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That, that word earnestly is translated in some other versions as fervently, intensely, unceasing, constant. Or my version is they were praying desperately. They were pouring out their hearts in prayer to God together. Now, is there any situation that God cannot change? Is there any situation that is irreversible, that God cannot turn it around? It feels that way sometimes. But the early Christians had learned not even death is irreversible. How did they know that? Because they had seen their Messiah, their King, the Lord Jesus, crucified and dead and buried. That's the end. It doesn't, there's no coming back, except that with God there is. They did not really expect the resurrection, even though Jesus had said he would rise again, but God did it. So death even is not the end. Therefore, they could pray. If Peter's in prison, what possible escape could there be? He's surrounded by four squads of four soldiers, 16 soldiers taking turns guarding him. This is maximum security. But they're going to pray. They're going to pray desperate prayers because they have learned God answers prayers, and nothing is beyond God's ability to reach in and to make a difference. So the question for, for us, what is your desperate need? What is the situation that you are facing that seems impossible? Or maybe not for yourself. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's uh, someone that you love, someone you're concerned about. Take that desperate situation and bring it to God with desperate prayers. What happens in Acts chapter 12 is, and we learn from this, is that we have desperate, desperate situation, we pray desperate prayers, and we can expect the unexpected. Because God does things that are beyond what humans can do, what happens, it says, uh, in the middle of the night while Peter is asleep, an angel comes and wakes him up and says, get up, Peter, put on your jacket. Peter gets up, puts on his jacket, follow me, and he walks right out of the prison. And it says here that Peter followed the angel out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. He thought, it's like a dream. It's taking place in my mind, but not in reality. How interesting. Peter did not expect to be led out of prison. And when he then is out of prison, then the angel disappears. Then he realizes, I'm really free. Where does he go? 
to the house where the people are gathered praying. He knocks on the outside door. A servant girl comes to answer the door, and she hears Peter's voice, and she's so amazed that she doesn't open the door for him, but runs back into the house and says, Peter is at the door. Now, the church is gathered in the house of, uh, uh, this house praying all night long, praying desperate prayers. It says, when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. So I want to ask, here's the church pouring out their hearts in, with desperate prayers. And we do hear sometimes we should expect an answer from God. Did they expect an answer from God? Well, maybe, but not that. For Peter to show up at the door is the last thing. They say, you are crazy. There is absolutely no way Peter is standing at the door. It's impossible. God has done it. It was impossible for Jesus to be raised from the dead. God has done it. We have situations in our life that to us seem impossible. God can do it. We should pray desperate prayers and expect the unexpected. It doesn't mean that God will answer in the prayer in the way that we are hoping for, but it does mean we can trust God in his goodness and his power. We've been taught that God turns all things for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So, we expect God to answer in his way, and we expect him to answer maybe in an unexpected way. If that, for some people, is too supernatural, an angel coming out into prison, let me give you a, a less supernatural answer or how things work out in, in surprising ways. On June 6th is the uh, anniversary of D-Day, when the Allies, England and U.S. and, and others, came across the English Channel and invaded France to free the country from uh, the Nazis. And not only France, but then through Europe. And you probably know that what Adolf Hitler and the Nazis were doing throughout Europe was terrible. Millions of people killed, especially Jewish people being killed, handicapped people, awful things. And the, the D-Day invasion over uh, hundreds of thousands of people coming across on boats of all sizes. And there are a few factors, military strategies and all sorts of things that made it work. But one other thing, and certainly there were people praying, there's one man named uh, Reese Howell, Reese Howell, that some people believe that his prayers in particular changed the course of the war. He was a man who prayed night and day, unceasing, desperate prayers. Now, I can't say that his prayers were answered in this way, but certainly there were people praying. One reason that the D-Day invasion worked was because that Adolf Hitler uh, did not let his generals make decisions about where to send their, their tanks, their panzer units, without talking to him personally. And Adolf Hitler slept in that day until 11 o'clock or 12. By that time, it was too late. Now, why did he sleep in? I don't know. But I'm saying that there can be these coincidences that, that add up so that the thing that you are praying happens. Maybe there's an angel that comes and wakes you up and leads you out of prison. Maybe there's some strange coincidence that somebody falls asleep or somebody is not... What, however that works, your papers that you're waiting for, somebody finds it, falls on the floor, oh, I need to take care of it. A strange coincidence, God does unexpected things. We have desperate situations, we pray desperate prayers, and we can expect the unexpected. I mentioned the resurrection, that's unexpected. But we also, when we think about the future, God's kingdom will come. He will make all things right. He will handle all injustice and all injury and make things good. How will God do that? Because there is so much injustice and injury in the world. We don't know exactly how. 
but we know that He will. Now, Angelo read the Scripture, gave an announcement. He was also playing guitar, and Angelo is going to come back up and lead us in prayer. I told Angelo this morning, you're doing more than I am. <laughs> Angelo, come, lead us in prayer. He's going to refer to his trip to Pakistan and what he learned about prayer and desperate prayer there. I'm going to watch uh, a little movie of what I have seen in Pakistan just to encourage you. Um, and then I will continue. So. you understood uh, the conversation, um, but when I was there, um, yeah, I just want to ask who maybe has been praying so desperately that 
they felt the house shaken that they could feel God's presence entering into the room. Um, and that's exactly a reference what also happens to the church in uh, Acts. Um, it also says at 431, while they were praying, the place they were meeting trembled and shook. So it was they were fearing and they got together, they were just praying so desperately to God and God intervened that everything was trembling. Um, so I just want to read something really short and maybe some of you will recognize yourself in this part. So a desperate prayer, it is not a, is a prayer when there is nothing else um, available. Um, no, no other options are available. It is a prayer to God, and it is a, God, a call to God on God alone. Um, it is a prayer that cries out to God. It is a prayer that begs to God. So some of you might recognize this, I think. Um, it might be a prayer where there will be tears. It might be a prayer you saw they were fasting also. They were praying all night long because they didn't have any other solution. It is a prayer that is birthed out of, um, how do you call it, um, crisis, out of um, being so desperately maybe in a depression or something. Um, but it is a prayer when you recognize that it is in God and God alone that there is hope and that the grace also comes from God and God alone. Um, and I really liked when I was in Pakistan, sometimes we had just like five minutes, but they just asked like, just pray for us, just pray for us. I didn't even hear the story, but they were like, just pray for us, just ask God to help us. Um, because they know everything comes from God, their help comes from God, their grace comes from God. And this is also, some of you will recognize this. Um, they have been maybe in their quiet place, crying also out to God. Um, and I just want to do this also as a church, like they in Acts, they gather together as a, as a whole. And it says, um, like, the believers were united as one, one heart, one, one mind. So I also want just maybe are there three people um, that want to cry out to God, and we will also as a church unite with them and pray because there are also people in crisis I think in this place um, so so I want to ask one person who wants to lead us and we will all join into this prayer for the people here in this place that are uh, in a desperate place um, then I also want to pr ask someone that want to cry out maybe for the nations that want to cry out for your brothers in Pakistan knowing that they also are crying out for Belgium. Um, so maybe there's also one person that want to do that and then another person that also want to cry out to God for our nation. I also got convicted knowing that when there was someone praying for Belgium, so God asked us to cry out also for our nation. We have the uh, elections, so maybe there's also one person that we will all join together. So maybe I can see some Hands, if there's someone is to want to pray for the individuals, is there someone? Thank you. Is there someone that wants to pray for Belgium for the upcoming elections also? Yes, amazing. Is there someone that also want to cry out for the nations, for our brothers and sisters in Christ that's having a hard time? Thank you. And let's all just join and be one in heart and mind.
The whole nation, the whole country, everywhere, every small, and everywhere. 